Hi, I'm uh, Curtis Murphy. I'm an assistant professor in the School of Humanities and Social Sciences at Nazarbayev University. And my book is From Citizens to Subject, City, State, and the Enlightenment in Poland, Ukraine, and Belarus. Uh, and this is a study of transformations that happen in East Europe as a result of new ideas stemming from the Enlightenment. And so most people, when they think about the Enlightenment, they usually have a positive connotation of reason and freedom and so on. But there's another aspect to it, and that is rationalization, control, ordering, and the desire to mobilize resources in order to create more uh, utopian states, you might say. Um, and this kind of thinking played a particular role in Eastern Europe, uh, particularly as a result of the partitions of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, which exposed uh, the various peoples of, of this region to numerous different regimes, all of which had some vision of reforming them and transforming them in accordance with Enlightenment era ideas about rationality and the importance of centralized authority. And so I do a comparison of different cities, some that are now in Poland, some that are now in Ukraine, and a few that are now in Belarus, as they transition to these various regimes. So this includes uh, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, uh, it includes the uh, Duchy of Warsaw, uh, which becomes the Congress Kingdom of Poland, and it also includes the Russian Empire. And so the stuff specifically about Ukraine is mostly viewing how these cities transitioned from the eastern reaches of uh, the Polish crown to uh, the Rus Russian uh, gubernia uh, in the 19th century and what the various policies were. And it's specifically how the Russian Empire tried to uh, civilize and integrate these territories in accordance with its ideals of what reason and um, progress should look like. So my view is that the Enlightenment vision is itself a kind of worldview and it View, it has a particular set of priorities that it uh, proposes and that these priorities are to a certain extent based on abstract assumptions about human nature and about uh, the proper form of relationship between the state and, and, the, and the individual. So when I say inherent defects, I, what I mean is that many of the policies that were intended to improve people's lives, and because this was certainly the rhetoric, is that uh, the new regime is going to be improvement. And in fact, if you read um, Russian textbooks to today, the idea is that the Russian Empire was this sort of progressive period for all these regions, um, among them Ukraine. And so the, the idea is that this is a progress-bearing regime. Um, but the problem was that Russian officials, among others, viewed the cities of Ukraine in particular uh, through the prism of their expectations from Russia proper. And so they applied a series of policies to try to reform them based on what worked in Russia or what they thought worked in Russia. Um, but those policies had ac absolutely no relationship to the complexities of cities that existed in Ukraine. And so there was a lot of trying to cram Ukrainian complexity into a Russian box, um, which resulted in a number of... Um, problems, and I can give you some examples if you want. Okay, so for example, um, the, the reforms that the Russian Empire introduced were based on the Charter to the Towns of Catherine the Great, which was promulgated in 1785. Um, and the Charter to the Towns was primarily modeled on St. Petersburg, and this is something that George Monroe has already written about. Um, but it assumed a Russian-speaking uh, orthodox commercial world, and it assumed that there would be a large number of literate um, and well-educated commercial people. And the cities in uh, Ukraine, particularly where I study, Valhynia and Podolia, like uh, Lutsk and Kremenets um, and Kamenets Podilsky, uh, these cities were quite different. For one thing, most of the trade and um, even the artisanry were in the hands of Jews, uh, which I think is well known. Um, and even if there were Christian merchants, they were often dependent on Jews for their supply chains. Um, and so 
The other issue was that many of the Christians, both uh, Ukrainian and Polish speaking, actually made their livelihood by farming. So they weren't technically urban in the sense of occupation. They were urban only from their, um, from their, you know, occupation or from their rights. Um, the other big change is that um, in Russia, the sale of alcohol was a monopoly of the state, and in Ukraine, it was a local business that many people had a hand in. So in attempting to push all these um, factors into the model of the charter of the towns, uh, they came into a number of problems. One of which was that the rules eventually decided upon decreed that only one third of the town council members could be Jewish. So only a third could be Jewish, but that was virtually the entire literate population. And so they ended up not actually having re, uh, people who could serve in their town governments uh, because they could only have, you know, three out of nine could be Jewish. So that was fine. But the other six, where would they come from? Um, the only other people were um, t uh, people who were technically farmers. So there was sort of problems with trying to implement these rules. Um, another thing that I, uh, another I think even more interesting thing is this question of private towns. Um, it, if you know anything about the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth, you know that a lot of the towns were ruled by these feudal lords, these great landlords uh, like the Lubomirski family and so on. And these towns were actually quite wealthy and powerful, and the people who lived in them enjoyed a number of privileges because of their scarcity. They needed um, the owners needed them to make money for them, and so. Uh, people actually moved to these towns quite voluntarily because the conditions were often better than those that were part of the so-called state. Um, and so the Russian Empire had to deal with these towns. They needed towns to form part of their administrative system, right? Uh, they, each gubernia had a capital and each gubernia was broken up into districts and the districts all had to have capital towns. And the only towns available for this were these private towns. Um, and so the Russian Empire found itself caught in a trap because it couldn't just confiscate the property since it needed the support of the nobility, but it also couldn't tolerate the fact of any kind of political entity not being subordinate to the state. So it tried to sort of play both and ended up effectively making itself dependent on these private town owners uh, who they had to rent buildings from in order to build a government. Um, and the Russian imperial officials complained about this all the time. They complained that, you know, the private town owners don't want to rent them buildings and they don't want to uh, help them out. Um, and so what this led to was this constant debate of how to so-called emancipate these private towns. Um, and eventually what was res resolved upon, at least in the early part of the 19th century, was to buy them out just like the way serfdom was abolished in this area. They uh, let the town people pay for their own emancipation, um, but, but unfortunately the government didn't have the resources to organize these kind of deals um, until the late 1860s. So until then there was this kind of um, hybrid status uh, where these, the people who lived in these towns were caught between the owner and the state, neither of whom could do much for them. Uh, so what we end up have seeing is that the state's attempt to, in a sense, bring progress and enlightenment to these territories makes it worse for uh, the people who live in these places. It's kind of interesting because it's a little difficult to, to um, get at the nationality of some of the people in the documents that I have. Uh, the documents in the 18th century are almost exclusively in Polish or Latin, and the documents in the 19th century are mostly in Russian. Um, and you see certain indications that that not, might not be what people are speaking on a day-to-day -day basis because of the mistakes they make um, in uh, the typography or the fact that, you know, they prefer H to G uh, whenever they're, um, uh, they're recording things. But the impression I have is um, that the cities, the, the, the power in the cities is usually in the hands of the Catholic Polish speakers whether they're Polish ethnic is that's a different question. But you know, this, the, the story that I have is, is a little bit uh, different from this because you know, um, Russia has this idea, right? And it still kind of has this idea 
that when it took these Ukrainian territories from uh, the Commonwealth in 1793 and 1795, that it was reclaiming the Russian land, right? That it was reuni reunifying Rus. This is the narrative that is often propounded. Um, and so the goal in, officially of Russian policy was to turn this area into um, Russia and to pretend like there had never been this separation or this whole past, however. Um, but actually what ends up happening is they have to adopt something of like a colonial policy towards the region. And so um, because the region has so many, is so full of Jews and so the institutions are so different from the central Russia and because um, of the complexity of the laws, they end up changing their model quite substantially in the Ukrainian territories. And so this Russian period of rule actually fails to integrate Ukraine quite quite uh, significantly. It doesn't bring Ukraine into the Russian heartland. If anything, it pushes it further away because there's co they're constantly making exceptions about uh, institutions. Uh, for example, I'm fa I mean, the most famous probably is that this area doesn't get the Zemstva, these uh, after the great reforms. Um, the municipal government is only introduced much later. A lot of the court reforms are changed they end up using much more hierarchical power structures in Ukraine, uh, which has the legacy of keeping this region rather separate from Russia proper up until 1917. Um, so in terms of whether or not it's, uh, it, you see this, domina you do, this domination of Poles over Ukrainians, I think that's, that certainly declines. Um, instead, you see rather the gradual domination of Russian bureaucrats over the region, um, but who are constantly feeling as though they have to keep, make exceptions and keep this place separate because it's not ready to be integrated yet. Uh, so um, uh, the other issue is that, um, that these enlightened policies, once they seem not to work, because they never quite work, everyone is constantly complaining that this region is disordered, and Ukraine is always the place that seems in the eyes of enlightened officials to be the most disordered and the most, um, the, the most backwards. Uh, and there's constant complaints going to whatever center happens to be there, either to Warsaw or to St. Petersburg, that, that this place is, um, is one that cannot be reformed. Uh, one person mentions, uh, one official even still under Polish rule mentions that um, the Ukrainian cities are the most disordered because they're settled by Jews and Cossacks, and so that there are no um, there are no real like, good Christian burghers. In this case, meaning Poles. The Russians then later complained that there are not enough Russians, um, and so I, both sides seem to suggest that the problem is some kind of there's some kind of ethnic problem with this region that makes it uh, ill suited to uh, progress. I spent. Uh, time in Warsaw in the, the main archive of historical acts. I spent time in Kiev in the um, central historical archive and I spent time in Lublin and Krakow. Uh, so it's sort of divided into four different archives and I use a couple of different types of sources. I use um, central documents, so the minutes of meetings and uh, councils or in the case of the Re Russian Empire, the um, the decrees of the governor, authority, the gubernial authorities, and um, the sort of local authorities. Um, and I also use the city records of, of individual cities. Um, so it's sort of a dialogue between what the center is doing and then how the cities are reacting and then how the center is reacting to the city's reaction. Um, because in many cases, policies have to be adjusted uh, once it is determined that these um, uh, decrees are not being um, implemented. Um, so, for example, there's always this constant struggle to try and improve the sanitation of the cities. Everyone agrees the cities have bad sanitation, that there's, you know, dirt and disease on the streets, there's no plumbing. Um, and so there are all these um, decrees saying that citizens need to clean up their streets, the citizens need to stop throwing dead cats uh, in their alleys, you know, some of them are rather uh, detailed about what the citizens are doing, which is uh, bad. Um, 
But and they're happening again and again, and it's quite clear that no one is actually um, obeying them. Um, the Russian authorities are much less interested in in dead cats than they are in um, what's called delopraisvotsva, you know, the uh, production of documents. They they uh, are very unhappy that none of the cities are recording their documents in the appropriate manner, and so they're constantly uh, fighting with them about that. Um, but you certainly see that the decrees are not getting fulfilled and they have to be uh, reinterpreted and they have to be reissued and so forth um, over time. Um, and you see from the, uh, the city perspective how different groups of people within the city are interacting. Um, particularly, we have you know, the city government, which is the, usually the wealthy oligarchs. You have the common people, which is anyone who is an enfranchised citizen. And then you have the Jewish community, and then you have people who live in the suburbs who often have their own self-government. So all these different groups are interacting. Um, and one of the things I try to show is that the system that existed before 1795, it was very messy. And it w looked really confusing because there are all these different court systems. There are all these different laws. Uh, people are constantly suing each other uh, in different courts. Um, but what you end up having is a situation where there's so many overlapping authorities that even the poor kind of suburbanites who are usually more likely to be uh, Ukrainian or Ruthenian, we'll say, um, can usually find some kind of justice or protector. Whereas in the centralized hierarchical system implemented after 1795, it's much more difficult because you have to complain to the... Um, to the mayor, who's a, who's usually dependent on the the prefect or on the um, the governor, um, and you know this is where you get this stuff like Gogol's uh, Revisor, uh, where you have you know the, the corrupt mayor who doesn't have to do anything until the government turns their eye on him. Yeah, well, because there there is a difference specifically between Poland and Ukraine because of the different structures. Since Pol what was today Poland was mostly the Congress Kingdom of Poland which had a bit more autonomy and um, had a Polish language administration. Uh, and then there's the Russian Empire. And even though both of these are technically ruled by Alexander I and then Nicholas, um, they have enormous differences. Uh, the Polish system is modeled on the Napoleonic system, which instituted it, and it is much more um, bureaucratic. They have a lot more people working for the government. They have a lot um, more presence on the ground. Um, and they have a lot, and they have this sort of Napoleonic vision of bringing progress and enlightenment through good orderly government. Uh, and the Poles who are doing that really share that. They really believe that. Um, and so when we go back to this question of private towns, in the, the Polish area, you see a real concern to try and make and emancipate people from their private town owners, to try to improve the private town's uh, lives. Um, but their method of improving it is to make sure that each town has an appoint has a mayor who is appointed um, and who can have a salary. So um, which ends up actually creating more problems because it uh, creates tension between the, the citizens and the owner. Uh, in the Ukrainian areas under Russia, the government is much weaker, actually. It, it doesn't have as much of a presence on the ground. Um, it doesn't. It, it can act, but um, it's, it's much, I guess, skeletal is a better word. It's not weaker, it's more skeletal. And their ambitions are much less. The Russian Empire's ambitions are for, to have basic control and uh, obedience, and that's about it. Uh, so one of the things I, I found that I really like is that um, the government seemed to be happy as long as each town had a police force and a mayor. If they had a police force and a mayor, that was pretty much the box was checked and they were fine. Um, and the problem was that the salaries of the police and the mayor were based on a central scheme so that some cities like Kremenets had to spend their entire budget paying for a policeman and a, a, um, and a mayor. And so they had no money for any kind of improvement. And um, I have a report by a Russian inspector who says that he will comment on improvement projects in a separate form because the prefabricated government form has no place for commenting on improvement projects. So you already have a sense that there's absolutely no interest in whether or not these cities uh, have 
uh, better infrastructure or better uh, services or anything like that. They just have to have they have to have a policeman, and that's it. Um, so the empire's uh, interest is is less. So I'd say if you were to talk about difference between Poland and Ukraine, it's mostly differences in the externals. Uh, if before 1795, um, the different there are differences mostly having to do with um, the size of cities, the um, and the uh, the density of the urban network, but there aren't the cultural differences aren't so much there uh, in 1795. They're much stronger after 1795. I'll tell you one thing I was surprised by. Uh, I came at this assuming that the Russian Empire was a repressive place and that it was, you know, sort of the enemy of um, of any kind of uh, self-government and or um, or or basically, you know, that it was more repressive. Uh, what I found is that actually some of the private towns in the Russian Empire had it pretty good uh, because the government just left them alone. Um, they completely because they fulfilled on their own this criteria of police and order. Um, the government allowed them essentially a free hand, and they were able to negotiate uh, with the owners. Um, and even used the Russian Empire against the owners. So in Alika, which is in Volhynia, a, a town that was owned by the Rajivil family, um, we have this long-running dispute between the owner and the city, and the city keeps threatening to use the Rus- to call the Russian Empire, and they keep saying, you know, uh, we, we're going to ask the Russian Empire to intervene, and then the owner will say, no, 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 let's solve this ourselves. Um, and so there is this kind of interesting dynamic where the, by having the Russian Empire there, the, um, the owner is forced to kind of negotiate with the citizens. And so what I found was that this sort of my impression of the empire as being kind of strong and as, as sort of like steamrolling over all kind of initiative and um, was, was wrong. And that there, is, there was actually quite a bit of plurality there uh, in these Ukrainian and Belarusian territories. So... I guess the big point that I um, that I try to make in the book uh, is that there is a that this vision of enlightenment rationalism, uh, which become which is really a very similar vision on the part of the government of uh, Poland and Warsaw or the, the post-Lithuanian Commonwealth in uh, the 1780s and 1790s. It's the same vision in, in Austria, in Napoleonic um, Poland, and in Russia. There are differences, but there's a commonality of this vision, uh, which transcends all the various regions. Um, and that this vision has left such a huge legacy on Eastern Europe, right up till today. The people imagine that uh, the state is this very progressive thing, and that the the goal of any m- movement should be to have you know an independent state, um, and that uh, you you have this sort of uh, trajectory that every group should go through, which is that they should eventually uh, gain this sort of nation state as kind of their ideal. My point is that, that that is just one vision and that that vision is not necessarily the only vision that one can have and that the vision of people prior to this who lived in the cities, which I called this sort of civic republican vision, um, which was anti-hierarchical and more pluralistic um, and but much more messy, was also a vision about how the relationship between state and society should be, and that that vision um, was just completely discredited by the Enlightenment. That uh, because the Enlightened um, uh, thinkers won, they said that this these are people who are backwards and who don't who can't get their act together, and the reason that we can't improve this territory is because of these backwards people. And this this kind of thinking was applied in particular to Ukraine, which was conceived as the most backward uh, uh, place by the center. Uh, The center always sort of looked at it this way. Uh, But if you look at what people were doing in the towns themselves, uh, they didn't see themselves as backwards. Uh, They saw themselves as sort of rational actors who were working to defend their privileges and to um, ensure their own prosperity. And so in many cases, they often sabotage the... um, the efforts of the center uh, for their own interests. And they even sabotage efforts that are meant 
in theory, to improve their lives. Um, but they didn't see it that way. So uh, one of the things I'm trying to do is sort of provide a corrective and explore this sort of alternate vision and show how it played out um, and to suggest that, you know, both of these ideas are neither vision is absolutely correct and neither has a monopoly on, a, on understanding reality. But a lot, in my view, too much credence is given to this. Yeah, I guess the main thing is sort of the relevance for today is this sort of is just that, you know, the role of administration in in uh, perpetuating separateness, the fact that the empire, for all its rhetoric of integration and, um, um, you know, there's that book by um, Zinin Kohut, uh, Russian uh, Centralism and, um, and Ukrainian Autonomy. And that was sort of, I guess that was sort of my starting point when I approached this project was to expect Russian Centralism. But I found that Russian Centralism is much weaker than I thought and that, um, in fact, if anything, it probably contributed uh, in some way to this, uh, to the creation of, of uh, Ukrainian identity just by keeping it separate and um, uh, and not and never being willing to actually accept the territory for what it really was. The private towns suffered the the most. They, um, relative to the the, the cities, uh, the the royal cities, um, they decline demographically. They become basically villages. Uh, the cities that become part of the state are the ones that benefit, like Zhitomir, uh, which is, uh, it's, I, it's, it's not really that important of a city now, but it was the capital of the Volhynian uh, gubernia, and uh, it grew from a village um, where, which was described as, you know, like 1,300 people who uh, barely know that they live in a city to a city of about 50, 60,000 people by the end of the 19th century, because it was made this capital. So these decisions radically changed the, the demographic uh, social reality um, of the area. And, but all the private towns, which in the 18th century were huge, I mean, relative, the, you know, 3,000, 4,000 people, but that was a big city for Ukraine. Um, they all, they all flatlined or, or they didn't keep pace because there was no, um, the, the, the benefits that people received from them in the 18th century no longer existed uh, under the centralized state. Thank you. I, well, I appreciate you uh, you, you doing it. I, I, I was happy to, to, to do it. Okay, thank you so much.